All right, let's start. I'm Arne Metsä from PokerMania.com, and today we are talking about MTTs with Danita. Are you there? Yep. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hey. So you are an SNG player and quite good in SNGs. When when I have been reading your blog and you have been branching out in six maxes and MTTs, it then goes before. But yeah. I haven't seen a lot on MTTs. Why is this coaching about MTTs? Um, yeah, but, but basically, like you said, I think MTTs are the uh, format I can improve the most on. So, okay. Yeah, and, and I'm also trying to play MTTs on Sundays when I, when I can go for a longer session at least. So is it just that you like to play on Sundays because the biggest games are on Sundays or do you like to go on Sundays because it's a day that's always a free day for you and you don't have anything on Mondays so you can always go for a long session then or? Um, yeah, well, so, 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 sometimes I, I, I would say that uh, Sundays can it's, it's probably a good a good day to play entities on in general. So yeah, I in a way I agree with you, but mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't recommend playing Sundays if you are starting on MTTs and you are playing one day a week in MTTs. And practically the reason why I wouldn't suggest starting on Sundays is that the field sizes are going to be going to be at their highest on Sundays. And yep. when the field sizes are at their highest, then we are having a situation where when the field sizes are at their highest, we are having a situation where there's the most variance in tournament poker. And it might make sense like if we are playing at absolute high stakes of sit and goes, then it might make sense like if you are having a if you are having a fifty thousand dollar bankroll or hundred thousand dollar bankroll, then it might make only sense to play MTTs on Sundays, since you can't get high enough games running on any other day. Mm. <coughs> Trying to kill the echo a bit. Okay, tell me if it got better or not, and. Welcome everybody, Kasperi, Paistisilli, Eki, Jones, Eject Me, welcome. And if you are having questions on Danita, it's always something that you can ask here. We are starting a bit in a, in a freeform way. So there is one question on Eject Me is that, are you thinking about doing a transition to MTTs? Well, I, I, I don't think I'm going to completely transition into MTTs, but... Yeah, and well, it, it it's getting harder to win money on STTs and every day. So who who knows? But yeah, I think that the MTTs are a good backup plan since I think that the MTTs are going to be the last game to die in a way mm. that MTTs are they are still going to be very profitable and it's probably technically it's the easiest game to learn to win in since there is. There are so few completely unique situations and also the ROIs are like depending on do you play normal speeds, do you play, tur do you play turbo speeds, but the ROIs are two digit and, and you don't need to be as close as the best to the best players as you need to be in sit and goes like, especially in hyper sit and goes like you don't need to do a lot of mistakes compared to the best players. And you are going from a winning player to a break-even player, or from a break-even player to a losing player. And in MTTs, like you can be a player that might be might be quite far away from the best players, but you are still winning money since the player pool is player pool is the is the best. And in MTTs, there is also there's a lot of uh, opportunities to apply your edge when you are having an edge at some part of your game then it makes makes it possible to then it makes it possible to 
to apply a lot more edge in MTTs than in STTs. Yep. And I hope that I'm not looking like Brent Burns. I'm still having all my teeth, so it's <laughs> it's something. So I'm not Brent Burns in a camouflage. <laughs> he has more important things to do. Yeah. <laughs> but then there is one topic that I wanted to like get a bit of a, this easier going start here. So this is my first coaching in English since we have done the page update. And just well, like I like to put you on the spot. What did you like about our our site update? Uh, for, for me, yeah, uh, yeah, it, 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 it looks pretty nice, I would say. I, I, I also like the old, old one as well, but yeah. now, now that I've used the new one for a while, it's, I think it's very good. And we are having these Jekyll and Hyde, mo Hyde moments, so we are having the dark team and we are having the light team. Which yeah. one is your favorite at the moment? Uh, well, at, at at first, I I I didn't re really like the the white one, but now that I've used it for a bit, I'm liking it a lot more. So I'm I'm just using that one. And there's a question on Jones that where are you from, Danita? Uh, I'm from uh, Norway. Yeah, and Paistil says that if I remember correctly, he's from Eastern Europe. That's not correct. Yeah. <laughs> And you have been, actually, you have been doing probably, I think either you or Neo 1186 have been doing the most public private coaching. So, and you have been doing, uh, doing a few with Caleon as well. So, yeah. And to just add one more point here on the site update, what's cool and what people probably haven't noticed is that when you log in, you can subscribe to events and the events that you are getting notes are that you don't get a ton of emails but when you log in you can you can get uh get these alerts and you can get quite an easy easy note on what's going on on poker i mania and have it has your threads been replied to or have you gotten likes for your messages so this is something that i think that is is one of the best best updates yeah but enough of that. There are still going to be at least one more or two more posts for new new features that we haven't posted in the English side. So there will be some more more to come. And now that now there is going to be something that you have been waiting for. So we are going to we are going to go to MTT material. And in general, like always, like even when I know that Danita is a solid player, so I know that he's a solid player, so there is going to be a lot of things that are going to be good. Still, always when I'm getting a ton of hands, what I start to doing, what I'm going to start doing first is go through some of my basic reports to see that if there is something that I can see from the numbers that there is likely going to be something that we can we can improve quickly. And Paistisilli says that is this a two hour session or one? This is going to be a two hour session and my session plan is that we started with about 15 minutes of talk, just like general chit chat to get things relaxed, to get everything loosened up. And then we are going on my notes for about 30 minutes. We are going to have a break probably trying to aim close to the MTT break. Then we are having another session with Danita on, on the hands that he has marked. And there has been some commentary on his part. So, And I think that the hands that he has marked are really good, that they are not the, they're not the general markings that usually when I see MTT players that I coach, usually when I'm seeing marked hands, they are always going to be big hands when the player has been eliminated from the tourney and they might be completely self-evident hands. And those self-evident, I don't think that these hands are self-evident. These are actually, these are really nasty. So you might see me, me struggling as well to trying to find the optimal way to play. 
And there's still one more question from Eject Me that you have been playing long time now high percent STTs. Are you tired of playing playing those or and that's why you are adding MTTs? Uh, no, uh, um, I would say nine nine max hypers are still my favorite format to play. So I, I still enjoy playing those a lot. And actually, I think that for a player playing MTTs, it's still really good if you are having a quick format to play as well. Like yeah. if you are having only one table remaining, then you are going to have a good thing if you are having something like nine max hypers that you can get three or four tables and doing something useful in addition to the one table. Yeah. So that's also something that will help you a lot. And also when you are learning a new game, it helps a lot that if you are having a if you are having a game that you know that you are the win you are a winning player and I think that you are pretty close to the to the best players in the hypers already. So that's always going to help because there's always something that you can come back to in hypers. So even if, if it doesn't work out in MTTs, you can always come back to hypers. Yeah. So what I'm doing first in, in most situations, going through the effective stack size report and seeing if there is something, if there's something wrong. And this is pretty basic that I, that I do. And one thing that I notice at the beginning is that out of 1.8k hands, we are having minus two, all in adjusted big points per hundred. But when we are looking deeper into the issue, we see that we have been losing some like this is probably from two big pots in 150 to 200 big blinds deep. And mm -hmm. these are like two big pots out of 2000 hands that are making this be minus two instead of plus six or something like that. So, so general, this is like my first warning sign. Usually the solid adjusted big blinds, but when I'm seeing that almost all of the negatives are coming from the, comp the earliest stages and from only few pots. And we are winning plenty of chips since it's going to be like how much man money is transferred in a certain spot. And this is marked as average spot, even though it's total pots. But we can see that like, if we are looking at 150, 200 buy-ins in these hands that you have been given me, they, those are like, 20 times less important than five to 10 big blinds since there's going to be 20 times less money moving in 150 to 200 big blinds. So in general, if you are not doing completely stupid things in the early game, that's usually something that I don't, I don't uh, take note in these coaching sessions since it's not going to matter that much for a general player. The, it's going to matter where the money really moves and it's going to be from it's going to be mainly from five to 40 big blinds here. Yeah. <clears throat> and in here, we can see that there are some warning signs like in 10 to 15, 20 to 30 big blinds. And this might be something that is pretty much or is somewhat connected to a sit and go background, I think. Like for me, going from sit and goes to spin and goes, there was a lot of uh, learning out of ICM and it's like the sin of the old god ICM that I see. I see quite a lot in the in the 10 to 15 big blind situations like there are like if we are thinking ICM wise the ICM format mostly in nine max it and goes for example it makes it really hard to race call widely. So usually your ranges are going to be focused on having a small race call range that's going to be really strong to discourage your opponent for free betting too much. And then there's going to be a wider race folding range. But in MTTs, especially in MTTs that are scheduled MTTs, we can pretty much like throw ICM out of the window altogether we we don't need ICM for the early game and when we don't need the ICM for the early game we notice that there are spots like we can race call with king queen suited that practically never happens in an ICM structure game and it might be that it's going to be the optimal way to play it so 
that's going to be that's going to be something that we might be might be taking a deeper look at on like if i'm going to watch these i'm going to see that there are some small ranges in general i think that if we are at about half and a half it's going to be it's going to be quite close and probably uh, note that we will have on some of the hands as well that when we are having 10 to 15 big blinds stack depth are going to be an, at late positions there are going to be spots that rather than do a small race like we are we can be doing the small race with a really polarized range but i haven't seen you limping like probably not a single time in these in these spots and i think that there are going to be spots like from let's say 8 to 20 big blinds deep there will be spots where limping rather than min raising or shoving will create a situation where your opponent is getting a wonky risk to reward ratio and will be facing a harder decision like in mtt's also one of the one of the highlights will be that when we are hitting the end phase we are almost always playing a nine or eight player table so antes will always have a big or antes will always have a huge uh antes will always have a huge um antes will always be a huge factor so that's going to be that we are if we min race we are usually giving our opponents pretty easy opportunities to to shove or call our min races and getting their getting an easy way for them to realize their equity but if we would be using limping especially if opponents are not especially against opponents that are not folding too much against the min race then we are like if we are having a 15 big blind situation we are on the button or small blind we are we might be giving our opponent a situation where it's going to be a bit too big to shove comfortably so then they are going to have a situation where they would need to manage to either check then or bet small or shove and the shove is going to be the risk to reward ratio for shove like the reward is getting smaller but the risk is still going to be there so so that might be something that we we are going through and we can actually see that in here that we are seeing that there is zero limps at these levels so we know that there are not going to be late position limps yeah okay so this is something that i think that is missing from your game but where you could get some extra equity and yeah. especially in these areas where where we can manipulate the risk to reward ratio for our opponent okay and if we are going to 10 to 15 big blinds, mm, hand details, spot size and stack that pre flop 10 to 15. Then we are having a spot here. So actually, let's change from mm, positions report. And also, in, in here, it's going to also be that we can. We can probably, we can be even more aggressive in the in the late positions. I think that people are still going to give up too much in these spots. But when your head is calibrated in an ICM mode, it's going to take a slightly harder crank or or hit with a sledgehammer to the to the controls to. Like you might be thinking that with ICM that opponents are calling way too loose. But if you are going through the same hands with without ICM, you are going to notice that opponents are likely going to be calling way too little. And you might be at a spot that your opponents are going to, or your optimal play is going to be even more aggressive. Okay. And, and, and as I said, that we might be that there's also something that's in interesting that in 10 to 15 big blinds on on small blind we probably 
or this is like we are just talking about many six hands. So it might be that you have had just good hands on the bottom and not so great hands on the on the small blind. But it's always interesting to see in these like when we are shoving, we are pretty much uh, pretty much eliminating the power of position in post lock play. So in small blind, if we are shoving against our opponent, then we don't need to take into account that the opponent will will need to be so. In general, I think that for most winning players at 10 to 15 big blinds, that in turn big blinds, it's going to always be, probably always going to be less than 10 big blinds in MTTs, since there's always going to be eight players paying the antes at least. So I think that at least in the small blind term, there are probably going to be there are probably going to be spots where you could where you could shove even in 10 to 15 big blinds more and also probably some small raises would be would be better suited to convert to limps okay this is going going too easy when you are just saying okay <laughs> we're not getting any comments so I'm not um, thinking, or I'm thinking that am I going too fast or am I going too slow? Like this is self-evident for everyone. Or... <laughs> no, it, it 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 it's okay. I just <laughs> don't have any anything to add. But okay. Mm -hmm. And always as a reminder, on my sessions, it's always going to be for the chat as well. You can always ask. And in these public-private coachings, we are just aiming that we are always trying to get the two hours of the coaching time so if there are more questions then we might take a bit longer but and miss pose us from danita that i saw you playing a 45 minute turbo months ago you are still playing them uh i, I don't think i played them lately but um it i'm i'm going to play them play them again like i i just don't know when i think the 45 players are also they are good if you don't have a lot of uh, good MTT starting. Yeah. Like you can add some tables there and breaks are at the same time. And actually for someone starting to play MTTs, this is probably the game that I would recommend when you are trying to learn the MTT game as quickly as possible, since you can get a lot of final table experience that way. The final table is going to be almost the same kind of final table as there will be in MTTs and all the skills that you learn are going to be really easily translatable to MTTs. Yeah. And also something that the $5 and $11 progressive knockout MTT sit and goes 90 player games. I think those are probably the softest sit and goes at the moment. So mm. that's all, also something that if I would play MTTs on poker stars, I would pretty instantly add those games as well. Uh, yeah, I, I'm playing those usually, but I, I think for 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 this for this session, I I wanted to play as close to MTTs as possible. Yeah, so, so that's also going to be one one big thing to probably add here is that what's your game selection in MTTs in general? Like this is one Sunday's game, so I can probably probably take a look here. Uh, so yeah. we can see that there are like twenty five different blinds. So, like, what are your aims, or what are you aiming to play? Like the average buy-in is about four dollars here, so it's lower than your sit and go buy-ins, and that's great since the variance is going to be variance is going to be way higher in MTTs. So you'll need to usually at least half your binds when you're going for MTTs. Uh, yeah, well, the, the, this was not, uh, I, I, actually not really a normal session. I, it was more of a training session for me, I would say. Okay. Uh, I think I played fewer fewer tables than I normally do and just try to play. Yeah. The best you can. Yeah. So now we are having, uh, having the best hands that you have played, so. <laughs> Well, so I'm, now there is some pressure on to you. <laughs> yeah, and actually, I'm not super happy about how I played in this session, but I, I think it's pretty much. And actually, kiss my kiss my boss is getting to my next point in here. That kiss my boss asked, but are you allowed to play on multiple sites in Norway? Uh, yeah, 
yeah, I, I can play on probably the probably same the same sites as you can. And that's going to mainly be one of my my points here. Mm. That if you like to play MTTs, usually Poker Stars is not the best place to play. Poker Stars is probably the best place to learn to play MTTs. Like the 45 player sit and goes are like those are going to turbocharge your MTT learning since there are going to be and you are going to get good opposition quite from on quite early levels and you are going to learn about how to play regs, how to play randoms, you are going to learn to play final tables. But yeah. if you are like in poker, it's always going to be like money is going to be the points counter in poker. And if you like money, I think that poker stars is not going to be the best place to be. Like in MTTs, it's also going to like your bankroll is going to be dependent on your ROI that you think that are going to be in your gains and the um, and the field sizes. And on poker stars, I think that the ROIs are among the lowest and the field sizes are among the highest. So the first site I usually recommend is going to be 888 poker. And 888 poker, in my opinion, I have played MTTs there and poker stars. It's going to be way softer. You are going to get games that are are at five dollar level. You are going to get games that are going to be like cent games on poker stars. Also, when your if your average buy-in is around four dollars, then you are going to then you are also going to get free rolls that are going to be that are going to make sense to play in an hour, hourly sense. Mm, okay. And I think on Sundays there are going to be quite a good amount of games and. If you have watched Kaleon's coachings with Stack and Tile, it works pretty well. It's not as it's not as good as it would be with with Poker Stars with all the all the greatest tools. But I think that a, a good player playing on smaller sites can play a bit higher buy-ins and can get a bit higher ROI. And the variance is going to be that if you are playing if you are playing Sundays only on Poker Stars and there are going to be Sunday storms. You are going to play like out of 20 sessions, you are likely going to have like five close to break even, 14 bad ones, and then you are going to have one huge session. But if you are playing on sites that are going to are going to have smaller field sizes and higher ROIs, you are going to have like if you are having 20 sessions, you might have 12 sessions that are like, or 10 sessions that are going to be close to break even, two sessions that are good, but not awesome, and then like eight losing sessions. So, and also on Poker Stars, if you are playing on Poker Stars, I think Poker Stars of FR might be, might be a good option for MTTs. Like, then you can get Poker Stars software, but you can get a bit easier competition. Yeah. That's pr probably something I should try to do. But mainly, if you are interested on MTTs, I'm highly advising that if you are interested in playing MTTs for the money and not just for fun or learning, then mm. it's going to be that the guys that are con guys that are on Poker I Mania that are consistently making money on the MTTs are playing on multiple sites, and they are playing. They are balancing the field sizes and the ROIs. So this is probably like I don't think that there is going to be anything more useful for your ROI or how much money you can make on MTTs that we can even discuss later on today. Since I think this is the this is probably the most important part. Okay. And as I said. That, in poker stars, it's a good environment into learning MTTs, but it's not going to be the best environment into making money with MTTs. Okay, that's good to know. And there are a few comments that 
Fars here Finland is saying only uninstall Poker Stars for the win. I don't think so, since if you are a good sit and go player, you are you can usually get higher uh, higher hourlies in sit and goes than in MTTs. And Miss Pose asked, what MTT buy-in do you recommend for me on 888? I play 45 minutes, 3.5 and some sevens. I'd say trying to average between two and three dollars is probably going to be. Like I think that the average field sizes are going to be about double, so like average field sizes are going to be between 100 and 150 players on 888. So you are going to need like if you are having a similar similar ROI, then you are going to need to have like one and a half times the buy-ins you have. But like you need to pay one and a half times lower. But I think on 888 you should be getting getting higher ROI. So might be that it might be close to close to the average buy-in on on stars. But it's like starting at least from two to three and trying to trying to get the free roll values out of there like the site is good in relation that the games are good the mtts are good but with no rate back it's not going to be that great site to play like sit and goes i know that kaleon has been crushing those sit and goes with quite high rois but but for the regular guys it's not going to be like out of those those guys that are not SNG monsters the 888 cut off the rake back is going to is going to influence a lot but but what i like on 888 even on even on sit and goes is that there is practically no bad sit and go starting on 888 and even when you are playing 45 minutes if you can if you can multi table them like like ask Haleon for his his system like he's playing i think 888 caption is the tool that he's using on 888 and, and then stack and tile for table management but it's pretty low friction or it looks a pretty, to be, be pretty low friction and and that's probably going to be the way like and when also when you are starting to play on multiple sites i'd say that don't start like now i'm going to register to all sites at once i think that the more profitable way to do it would be to register to one site add one site get everything working then do the then to do the next site there's no need to add everything at once pretty much the same as with with hard use like you if you are adding everything at once you are probably going probably going to not get optimal results always work always work the changes gradually don't do big changes, do small changes and be better. Be better every week. And of course, like it's going to be different for for if you are playing MTTs only on weekdays, or if you are playing MTTs every day, and then you are playing MTT, or if you are playing MTTs only on Sunday. Like I think that when I said to Misspost that it's going to be somewhere between 100 and 150 that the average field size is going to be. It's going to be on average if you are playing every day, but if you are just playing on Sundays, I think that the field sizes on average will be like 250 to 350. So Sunday will increase variance, but it will also increase the amount of edge, since there are going to be worse players on the table and there will be a lot more players that have satellite from smaller tournaments that are are not usually the best players on the tables questions comments uh no it so, sounds good <laughs> and as i said that in my opinion 888 poker is the first destination to add as an mtt player yeah, okay. so I think it's it's among the highest value. Then what's going to be the next? I think that's that's something that will be more debatable. What's going to be what's going to be the next site to add? Like I think that there are going to be there are going to be advantages for Vinamax.fr, PokerStars.fr. So the French sites are are I think that they are quite good in in regards of. Then there is going to be 
I think micro gaming is going up at the moment, so there are going to be higher guarantees and but it's probably not going to be the single best best place to be. I think iPoker is also, if you can just tolerate the software, it's going to be quite okay place for MTTs and and on game might have some good ones as well. Okay. Okay. I'm actually pretty much at the end of my topics to discuss, so we, we should probably go go towards the hands and use the all all use the about the last 15 minutes before the MTT break. Like when we are doing an MTT set, then we are always trying to aim for the MTT breaks. And basically, 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 this is just one Sunday. Perhaps we should have talked to talk to getting some some more Sundays, so then there would be more to filter. But this is just like a quick one on what should I comment and. I wouldn't worry, if I would be you, I wouldn't worry about the all-in adjusted big blinds, since you are making money on every spot that counts, basically. That you are making money on, you are making money on the buy-in levels that most money is moving, so, and you are make, you are losing those BBs in few big pots early on. Yeah. So, it's not a warning sign. But so, there are going to be some interesting hands, and if you are going through these hands, then we might be searching for, searching for some great ones. Actually, I got through the, this in this order, and there's going to be one good hand to start this with. So, let's try to, let's try to get the... Oh, I don't have my HUD stats anywhere, but when I'm seeing that this is also something that I'll... I'm going to see in MTTs a lot. We are having like four hands on every player. What do we do with the HUD right now? Like nothing. Like there is not an advantage of the HUD if you don't have the data. Yeah. He checked me, asked, what are the most crucial stats for MTT HUD? The same, are they the same as 45 men? Actually, that's a great point. Since in 45 minutes you can get you can get a good sample size on some players, but if you are if you are having uh, if you are having an MTT, you should be focusing more on you should be focusing more on stats that are. You should be focusing more on on stats that are going to be even quicker. So, like VPIP and PFR are going to be great stats in these games, since you can get you can get pretty good idea on what your opponent is is about with those two stats. And I think that MTT HUD can usually be quite simple, as when you don't have data, then I think that there are like two traps that people are falling when they are having too many stats around. And the two traps are that first is going to be analysis paralysis, that they are looking at the situation, they are looking at all of the stats and they can't decide like what's going to be the best option. And they are using a lot of, st a lot of time for decisions that are quite simple and the other is going to be that it's over reading the HUD like if you are having just four hands on your opponents we are having almost no useful stats out of most of our table and even on this guy if you are looking like how often does he steal from bottom like he's 100% he's super aggressive it's one hand so and this is also like when we are playing eight or nine player games, the steel stats by position take a long time to emerge. So it might be like in general in sit and goes, I advise going through going to have different steel stats or different RFI stats available. 
but I think that in MTTs it might make sense to combine them all to a single steel stack to get more hits to the single steel stack and trying to just get an idea how positionally aware, aware a guy is and not look at the not look at the absolute numbers. And kiss my bass is also correct that making notes is important in MTTs. They often give you more information than HUD. Like with HUD, if we are having four hands on someone, we don't get a lot of ideas on how does he play a certain type of hand. But if we have seen his hand, what he went to showdown with, then we are going to have a have a lot better idea on on what's going to what's going to happen. Like we might see that we might see a leak on our or a probable leak on our opponent's play by one single hand that has gone to showdown. But if we would just uh, tear it up and make it as a stat, it's going to be a lot harder to it's going to be a lot harder to to get a good idea out of it. So I think that's a really great comment for Kiss My Bass and especially it's going to be important when you are going to be nearing the final tables. Like if you are playing one table or if you are playing one table that's close to a final table and you haven't made a note on any of your opponents, you are doing it wrong. Like, sorry, but you are doing it wrong. Because you might think that, okay, I can re remember this, but it's always that I'd say that it's going to be easy to it's going to be easy to cheat yourself that I'm going to remember this. But when you have made a note, when you are seeing the same player in two weeks or two months, then you are having some kind of an idea when he what he plays. And this is going to be more important when you are playing on playing on the smaller sites. When you are going to see other guys more often. Even in 180 player games, I know that I had one player that a few years ago that we had played in like 500, 180 mans, and we had still something like 200 or 300 hands that we had played in the same table. Like it was still really rare to even see a, see a sit and go where we had have been sitting at the same table even a, even a small while. So for MTT HUD, my thesis is that it needs to be simple and focus on all the stats that are going to get a lot of clicks and you can get useful stats out quickly. So like when we are going through these, we are like VPIP, it has clicked every hand. There's seven, 35 hands that have been used. It's a good stat. PFR, 32 hands that it has clicked. It's a good stat. It's going to get a sample size quickly. Pre-back pre-flop, it's getting clicked once every three hands. It's going to be a good stat. Like fold to pre-flop, pre, -flop, pre after race, it has clicked once or twice in 35 hands. Probably not going to be that useful. Uh, limp fold, zero. If our opponent doesn't limp, he doesn't have a limp fold, so it depends on an opponent. Like fold blind to steal, one click, not that useful in MTTs. Fold blind to steal when facing an open charm, not that useful when you don't have when you don't have hands. Like total ag aggression frequency, not that useful. Fold to flop, but not that useful. Like in 35 hands, this opponent has gone to flop twice, basically. Raised first in an early position, once in three hands, might make sense. Raised first in MP, only four hands. So like when uh, EP guys are opening or limping, then this raised first in gets triggered a lot less than the raised first in in the UGG. And like if we are combining all of these late position steals, we are going to get like three clicks. So it's like one in ten hands. So. It's getting useful, but you're still going to need about 100, 100 hands on your opponent before you can make any kind of any kind of ideas. 
comments, questions? Uh, sounds good. <laughs> Let's yeah. try to go through one hand before the MTP break. Yep. Actually, I need to. Oh, I have it here. Look. So trying to just get all of the stack sizes visible, even though the stack size are going to be less important if this is not a final table. And when we are when we are seeing this many guys on the table, I don't think this is going to be a final table. What do you think about this spot? Yeah, generally I would be interested, I think. This is actually one spot that I think that we we could make a pretty good pretty good point into limping. Like our hand is playing pretty good on the flop. We are like even depends on our opponent how much does our opponent fold too much. But I still think that Jack Nine is going to be one of the best hands to limp. Like it's going to be a hand that we want to see the flop with, and it's going to be. This is going to be a situation that if we limp, it's going to be really hard for our opponent to. Our opponent to three bet chug, but if we are if we are min raising here, we are getting a four thousand chip pot already. So we might make uh, make a point that it would make our opponent uh, like if we are min raising here, we are making the pot to be closer to closer to five and a half k. So then our opponent will have will have a possibility or quite nice possibility to actually re raise shove here. Okay. So, like I said, 5.5k, close enough. So, this is one of those hands that we don't mind if our opponent is calling, but this is pretty much smack in the middle of these hands that is going to play well, it's going to hit flops well, it's going to be medium strength hands, so it's kind of like a hand that you can't race call ever, but you just don't like race folding either. So those are kind of the hands that you would want to go to the go through the go towards the flop with or go towards limps. Like when you are when you are building your ranges, those are going to be the those are going those should be the bread and butter of your limping range. And it's going to be really hard like if you limp your opponent is going to risk 30k to win 4k. And if you are if you are min rating here, you are making it a bit easier. It's not still an a really easy spot, but I think that it's going to there are going to be a lot more shoves in his range. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I I, I have been uh, I th I think I I I would I would limp a lot there against players I know that defend a lot, but against unknowns I'm. Usually not having that much limping range. Yeah. I think that's also going to be something that you need to go through. If we would have a lot, if we would have more hands on our our stats, then we, then we might have an have an opportunity to check like what's going to be the best option. But even if we are having like even if we are having an opponent that's folding like sixty five percent, I'm still unsure like. We are making an auto profit with min raising, but I'm still unsure that it's, it's still going to be the best with with a hand like Jack Nine, Jack Nine off, Jack Nine suited would probably be better to better to limp at that point, quite certainly. But I think even if people are making mistakes that you can auto profit, even still, I think that there are going to be going to be good chances on good opportunities to to also. Like we are not only thinking about what's going to be plus CV, we are we we should need to be thinking about what's going to be the most plus CV. Yeah. Jones twenty nine says that then we when we limp we fold hundred percent of the time if there comes a normal size race. Why? If opponent raises it to three x, why are we folding Jack nine off? I don't think that we are like the point of limping is that we don't need to fold these hands that are going to play nicely. 
the point is to throw throw our opponents risk to reward ratios out of whack and also the point is that is that we don't need to fold the hands that are going to play play quite nicely there might be some some hands that we might we might limp fold against the normal size race but generally I think that we would aim to build our limping range to be in a way that we are not folding we are not folding 100% of our limping range to a small size race there needs to be and I think that we should actually be folding quite a little what kind of hands can we limp call I think like jack nine off is going to be going to be a hand that we can limp call even if opponent is having a if is having a better part of his range, we are still having having plenty of outs with Jack Nine off, even without without position. I think that it's going to be. And hello for Nexus Six, Alex and Lavinia here. And okay, then we have got to the flop with Jack Nine. And we hit the middle pair with jack nine but the board is monotone what shall we do yeah. it should be a c but i think I, I i don't think he has an ace very often and yeah. basically if we see that here we are making our opponent fold most of his hands that are not containing an ace or are not containing a spade Mm. And I think that that's going to be a that's going to be a good idea. And also one of the points is that our hand doesn't have doesn't have as much value here. Like if we would have jack of uh, spades and nine here, so that we would have a we would have a flush draw. Then this would be a completely different thing. Then I think the checking will be almost always better. But even when we have a middle pair, our hand value is not going to be that good. So we are not risking that much if we are if we are seabedding this and need to need to fold this. We are not folding a lot of equity and we are not folding a lot of showdown value. So it's going to be so rare to get to showdown. And we are getting back to this hand after a break. Now MTT break surprised me, so perhaps we should have tried to do the same, to do the basic stuff first then. So, five minute MTT break, we will be back in five minutes. <laughs> 